we're going to look at one step equations, which means they're one step away from knowing the solution because there's one thing that's standing in front of them or blocking their way to having us know what's the magic number. The magic number is the solution to an equation, and we want to find the right number that makes the equation kind of work out. Once we find the solution, We can test it in the original equation. one-step equations and some of our multiple step equations, the target will be visible right at the beginning of the problem. In other cases, the target may be hidden at times, and that won't be at the beginning, but at times, we will not know the target. Until after we find what we think is the solution. Because if we made a mistake, then we're wrong, and we'll know that we didn't find the target, because the goal is to have both sides equal the same number. If the target is staring at you and saying, I need you to get this expression to create, using a particular value, the result of 7, because 7 is your target, then you leave the 7 alone and you do the work on the other side, and you find out if you can get it to hit the 7. But sometimes, you'll do the work out, and without finding the target, you'll say, this is the magic number, the solution, the number, the one number that makes both sides equal. Then your job will be to take what you think the solution is back to the first expression and determine what it makes. Now you have a target. And now you go to the other side of the equation. Often it's left first, then right, but not always. Go to the other side and find out what that makes. And if they hit the same target, you have found the solution. No matter what the target actually happens to be, if they're the same, but they both hit, you found the solution. So we're going to have visible solutions in a lot of these. What we're going to do to solve a one step plus or minus equation will be an equation that has a plus or a minus visible in it. And the words that I use our target, interference, and eventually we get our solution. So number one, locate your target. If it is a one-step equation, you can see the target. And that's the number by itself on one side of the equals. So if you have one that's got a clear target, that's a number that doesn't have a variable and then some other action going on with it. Number two, determine your interference. Determine the interference. Interference, quick explanation of what interference is. I grew up with interference. We'd want to watch a baseball game out of New York or out of Boston, and we had this antenna that was connected to our TV and was supposed to pull the signal out of the air so we could watch the baseball game. And on really clear days, we could get a really good picture. But if it got cloudy, it got fogged in. A lot of little fuzzy stuff, you couldn't hear the noise, it made cackling, you know, popping and stuff like that. You get it now, right, when the satellite goes out. Cable not so much, because cable is more directly wired to you, but with the satellite, you'll catch a lot of that. Or with your radio, if you're listening to terrestrial radio, you'll get that. Also digital. Anyway, the idea is when you're traveling around, you don't always get a perfectly clear picture. And the stuff that's causing you not to see exactly what you want or hear exactly what you want is interference. That's the stuff that's in the way. So we would go out and we would turn the antenna and try and get it pointed in the right direction to get the least interference possible. We never got a perfect picture. So when Cable came, we were really excited. But never got a perfect picture. We got the best we could by eliminating interference as much as possible. We have to determine what's interfering. Why is it that our x, or whatever letter we're looking for, is not already alone? It's called isolating the variable, what we're trying to do. Number two, 
number three. Complete the inverse operation. The inverse means it's going to wipe out the interference. Of your interference, you can't just say interference be gone. There's a price to that. Paying for cable or whatever, getting a really good antenna, whatever it is. Complete the inverse operation of your interference on both sides of the equation. Now, in order to get the solution, it does not care what your target is or how it's going to manipulate the target to something else to get you to the key that is going to find the solution for you. You have to get the key done by, look, if this is 5 too high, i got to make it 5 lower. And i got to make both sides 5 lower because each side was too high. If it's too low, i got to bring it up. If it's 7 too low, i got to bring both sides up by 7 to find out what is it that x is without interference. And over there, I've got an adjustment to what the target was to find out what's going to get the job done when the interference reappears, and we, we plug it back into our equation. OK, you're going to reduce the variable side. The variable side is going to reduce to x, or whatever letter you have. I'm going to write to x, but if you have a different letter, it'll be that letter. The other side was made up of a number that was the target, and now here's something else happening with the number. So you're going to simplify, or you're going to, you know, we could say, oh, yeah, we've been, instead of solving, right, we now have an expression over there, which is all numbers. On what I call the number side the side that did not have x. There's one side that'll have x and one side that won't. You've got to get the interference away from x. And now, whatever we did to x to make it bigger, smaller, divided, multiplied, we've done to both sides because the target wasn't my solution. If the target's too high, bring it down. If the target's too low, bring it up. That's what this inverse operation is going to do. It's going to maneuver the number to get you toward the solution by undoing the interference. It's going to negate the interference it's going to take it out of the way and let you see a clear picture of what your solution is. And you're going to check your, and you're like, oh, check the work. You're going to check your work on this because when you take the number that you think is the solution, it will hit the target if it's right, and it will miss the target if it's wrong. End of story. That's it. We don't go in knowing the number. We solve for the number. And then we say, is this exactly what the customer wanted by plugging it in? You know, if you set up someone so that they were going to have lights in their house, and you said, OK, I'm done here. I wired up your house. You don't walk away and say, the house is going to work when they hit the switch. You flip the switch and watch the light come on. That's what it's like when we put the number back in. So that's when we really find out that it worked. Not like, hey, I got five. I love five. That's a great number. Let's go. Let's call it done. Make sure that your solution in the original equation. Now, of course, the original equation isn't too far away right now. But you're always going to check your solution in the original equation. And it's supposed to hit the target. So here's something you might be able to do. You might be able to take a screenshot of this on your computer. You know, freeze the video here. And then take a screenshot of this and then put that to the side of where you watch the rest of the video, because this is not going to fit. I have very little room to work on many more examples on this board. But that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what we've got. It's got an equal sign. Find the target, which has no x on its side. Determine the interference. Y is x not alone. Complete the inverse operation, so plus the opposite of adding a positive is to add a negative. The opposite of adding a negative is to add a positive. The opposite of multiplying is dividing, of dividing is multiplying, stuff like that. The fractions, you know, with the reciprocals gets a little more challenging to compute, but it's still undoing the interference. 
Reduce the variable side. Because you got rid of the interference, there alone will stand the letter of your variable, x or whatever other letter it is. And then you'll simplify the number side, which is now not what it used to be, and it should give you a number that you think is the solution. And then you'll work with that to hit your target. So this is the set of rules that we're going to go through. And I'm going to take you through up top now. We'll leave it here for a little while. And we'll work on the top. If I get to a longer problem or need more space, I'll take that down. But we are trying to hit the target. Let's find out what's going on here. The target is much easier to locate because it's a number on its own side of the equal sign. So if we have x plus 9 equals 12, okay, you don't have to shout from the back of the room if we were in a room, it's 3. A lot of us know that the number you got to add to 9 is 3. If you have a dozen egg carton and 9 are still in there, what's missing is 3. That's true. But I want to show you this to build to tougher and tougher problems, starting with one that most of us can handle. So knowing the answer is 3 doesn't mean, oh good, I don't have to learn anything. What we have to do is take it like this. x is equal to, right, and we've got some colors coming in. What I have here is a target. I'm looking for a target of 12. That's what I want to get. Interference is not just the 9. Nine is what we call the operator of the interference. The name's not important, but it's the number that's getting the job done. What job is it doing? It's plus nine. Plus positive nine is the interference. And we want to negate that. The inverse of plus nine, inverse operation, would be to do subtract nine. So now if we look, we're trying to hit 12. But instead of knowing just what x is, we got a little x. If we give it 9 more, it lands on 12. We want to remove the extra 9 from both sides. So what we're going to do in a separate line right under it, we're going to add negative 9 to both sides. So it's like we're taking 9 out of this one, and we're taking 9 away from the 12. So if you went to a full dozen eggs, and you took 9 out, for the ones that had been added, this is going to go out and be 0, and I won't even write it. And we'll come out of here with x equals, and then, so let's look what's happened. We located a target of green 12. We determined the interference is a blue plus 9. On both sides, we decided to subtract 9. Reduce the variable side to x. Sure, 9 plus negative 9. I'm not going to write x plus 9 minus 9, or x plus 9 plus negative 9. Those two together as like terms cancel out to zero. I don't even write the zero. All I have over here is x, so that's why that goes just to x. Simplify your expression on the other side. 12 plus negative 9 is 3. So the solution is probably 3. I might have made a computation mistake. You know, if I did this out and I said it's 4, because I look at 12 minus 9 and I think it's 4, maybe, you know, whatever caused that then my solution won't be right. My process was right to get me on the doorstep with 12 minus 9, and then I got it wrong. But if your computation is correct, then you're going to get x equals 3. Now we have to go back to the original equation and see if that works. So what we have is plus 9 equals 12. And what do we do? We have 3, and I suggest you put it in with parentheses. It goes in the x position. And now we want to see if it equals what it's supposed to when we use it. Does it hit the target? 1 times 3 is 3. 3 plus 9 is supposed to equal 12. We don't know because we're still trying it. 3 plus 9, we do the work out on that. It is 12. And when it hits the target, then yes. Now we are set. Our solution is x equals 3 because our solution is the one number that works on that. Okay. If you try to use a 4 here, you'll get 13 instead of 12. If you try to use a 2 here, you'll get 11 instead of 12. If you try to use a negative 3 here instead of 3, you're going to get a 6 instead of 12. Only one number is going to get you there. Target was 12, we hit it with 3, 3 is the solution. This process this we, that we've established on the bottom is going to be the key to getting all of them, and 
after we determine the interference, one of the biggest steps is to decide what's the way to get rid of plus 9 with minus 9? How do I get rid of minus 7 with plus 7? How do I get rid of multiplying by 12, divide by 12? How do I get rid of dividing by 6, multiplying by 6? Big question for you to think about. How do I get rid of multiplying by 3 over 2? Interesting to me. If you multiply 3 over 2 by something, it should bring it back to 1. Reciprocal? Okay. Let's see. Next one we have is t minus 5 equals negative 5. A lot of people are like, got it, 10. No, not 10. Negative 10? Stop guessing. Okay. Here's what we got. We need a target. The target here is minus 5. That's the number we're trying to hit. Let's see what the interference is. Why is it not alone? Why is t not alone? Right? I want to make, make sure we're aware of this. The interference is why our variable is not alone. And that's for us to see the solution. So the interference is why it doesn't just say t is this number and we are done. That's your job. Here, the interference is two things. Don't just say that it's 5 or even that it's negative 5. I think it's plus negative 5. Because I would do this, right? t minus 5, t plus negative 5. What's the opposite of adding negative 5? So the inverse is the way we're going to get to this. Inverse operation, it's called. But you need an operation, which is like, what kind of math are you going to do in an operator, which is what number you're going to use with it. This is, say, adding negative 5. The inverse would be to add positive 5. You might think, how about if we minus negative 5? You want to work that hard? You want to introduce minus negative 5? That's OK, but you've got to then do much more work and not make a mistake with a double negative. Very risky. If we say that interference was adding negative 5, the inverse operation would be to add positive 5. And we're going to do that in both columns where like terms are. So we're going to add it where the numbers are. Plus 5 in the number column, plus 5 in the number column. If there is no number column, or if things don't have like terms, you create a new column in the spot on the side where you need it. But here, we had numbers of negative 5 in black on both left and right sides. So we'll go ahead and see that this is going to be gone and leave me nothing but t. So t is the letter this time. Then we hit our equal sign. And over there, we have negative 5 plus 5. And then I'll ask the class. I'll say, don't shout it out, but think about it. Negative 5 plus 5, what do those two numbers do? And if you say cancel, what does that leave you? And if you say nothing, what are you going to do with nothing? But if you say negative 5 plus 5 creates the number, so cancel is a good idea, but it's not the right idea, because you're not going to scratch it out and say t equals emptiness, t equals nothingness, t equals negative 5 plus 5. Math knows what that does. Even calculators, the cheap ones, too, know that that's 0. Do we think t equals 0? Really? Let's see. We go back and we do minus 5 equals negative 5, right, like it said. And then where we had our value, we put in 0. And because there's no coefficient, we'll go ahead and we'll put the 1 there for 1 times 0 to justify what's about to happen. We also have the plus negative 5 instead of minus 5. Now what's going to happen? Well, that side is 5. We don't know if they're equal. We're trying to find out. 0 plus negative 5. Are they the same sign? Then go ahead and add them. Are they different sides? Go ahead and subtract them. You decide. 5 minus 0, 5. 5 plus 0, 5. You're going to get the right digit because of what 0 does. What's farther from 0? Zero? 0 or negative 5? 0 is the, not the strongest. 5 is stronger, is negative. We get negative 5 here. And now, we see that that is the solution. So now I want to give you one that a lot of teachers, the way they teach it, 
They act as though you can't handle this problem because things are in the wrong place. Right? I don't want you getting into the idea that I can only solve it if X is there. I can do those all day, but if X is in the wrong place, then I can't do it. And the way a lot of teachers teach it is very concrete and only lets you do that. And then if they say to the careful people, this is really tricky. See if you can do it. I'm not going to say any of that because we're going to stick to our rules. Negative 25 equals y plus 21. Is this exactly the same as the others with y as a letter and bigger numbers? No. Is it solved the same way? Yes. But you shouldn't get your mind thinking, must go here, do that, do this, do that, number comes out, check in. No, it's not like that. Understanding what we've got to do as a job means we've got to find the target. And the first thing that we want to do here is determine our target. And that will make it easier to find the rest of it and get it to go. So I say, don't shout it out loud. You may have it. You may be wrong. That's OK either way. But give some thought to what you think the target is here. The target is the number that doesn't have x on its side. It's just a number sitting by itself. I never said which side it's on. The target here is negative 25. Why is it that our letter y is not alone? The interference is y. Your variable is not alone. And if we can get it alone, we can see the solution. But it's hiding the solution because of the interference. Here, the interference is positive or plus 21. Right? You put the plus so we can see an operator. So now we want to say, what's the opposite of adding 21? And that'll be our inverse. I call it inverse to get it shorter. It's the inverse operation. But actually, the inverse operation is to do minus or to add a negative. The inverse of the whole process is going to involve a negative 21. I think it's going to be adding negative 21, but you might think of it as minus 21. You know I'm not that big of a minus person. I'm more of a plus negative. So there's our original equation. I'm going to write the original again. It's a good idea to always write the original <coughs> equation, especially if it gets complicated. Again, because if you start making marks on this, you won't see the original equation later. You'll scratch something out, and it won't be clear what to go back to. So you write the exact thing again. It'll take five seconds max. You can afford it, and it will help you get more success in checking your work. And you're not checking your work because you're a geek who has to check the paper five times to make sure you got it right before you hand it in. You're checking your work because it will guarantee that your work is right. You can check your work five times when you add two numbers and get it wrong every time and each time think you're right because there's something going wrong there. But it's a lot harder to have it look like it works when you put it into the arithmetic and say, yeah, that number works, and have it be wrong. It's not a guarantee. You could make two mistakes that somehow worked out and got lucky. But mostly, if it works in the original equation, you have found the solution, which is what we looked at in an earlier one when we said, is this a solution or is it not? The inverse is to go negative 21. So I go to the side where y is, and I get to work adding negative 21, and I do the exact same thing on the other side. Why? Because each side was 21 too high to show me the solution. So now y plus 21 and minus 21 is going to get me nothing but the y. And here I have negative 25 and negative 21. So I put, the neg I put the 25 and the 21 up there without any signs. 25 is larger, and I have to decide negative 25 and negative 21. Do they work together or against each other? And it's not the way I originally saw the problem, and I encourage you not to say, oh, so you do this to that, you, do that, you change it to this, and there it works. The more you try to force a shortcut, the less you understand and the more mistakes you can make. So we're not trying to find, like, let me memorize these 150 things and do well in algebra and then remember them until I finish taking math at the very least. We want to understand the balance of what's going on here. But we do have this. 25 and 21 are both negatives. So they're going to work together, and they're going to get me 46. So my solution's going to involve a 46. Now the question for you is, and you're at home on your own, so you can shout it out if you want for once, because in the classroom I don't welcome it. When I add negative 25 and negative 21, I decide my digits are 46. Is it negative or positive? The answer is negative. Because the negative 25 is the stronger term, I will have a negative outcome. The 46 was already made, and here we have y equals negative 46. 
So let's go see if it works in the original equation where I had negative 25 equals their space for my y plus 21. Where I'm dropping in my variable, I'm going to drop in what I think is negative 46. That's my belief of what the solution is. And I'll put the 1 in that allows me to free my 46 from the parentheses. So we don't know. Negative 25 is over there. This is negative 46 plus 21. Now we go to 46 and 21. They work against each other. So we decide to subtract. And we get a 5 and we get a 2. We get 25 for our digits. We have negative 46 plus 21. We have decided that the digit value of this sum is going to be 25. 46 is stronger than 21, which is why my solution is negative, why the number I get is negative on 25, it hits the target, and that's what I know. And this checking is not like, I just like to be sure. This checking is using a completely different pathway to see if your number works. It's not, oh, go do the whole thing again and see if you get the same number, because most people will rush through it, have confidence, and believe they got it right. Instead, you're taking a number that independently now is resetting the whole concept of does negative 46 hit the target I'm looking for of negative 25? And you go back and you stop doing algebra and you use arithmetic. If you have a calculator because you're allowed to at that point, you can go grab a calculator and say, oh, negative 46 plus 21 equals negative 25, perfect match, done. Right? The idea is it's not doing the same work twice, it's seeing if the work that you've already put in does the job properly. So now we're going to add this one in. We're going to go with x plus 2 thirds equals negative 1 third. There's a lot of hate out there for the fractions. x plus 2 thirds equals negative 1 third. But that has to happen because it's fractions is when we're doing the arithmetic, after we've decided what our maneuvers are going to force us to do in setting up a process. When it's time to do the arithmetic, then we can go ahead and say, oh, I wish they weren't fractions. Well, right now they're just pieces we have to move to get the right format. And if you're allowed to use your calculator, it'd be really smart to do that so that you can add the fractions and stuff like that. So, we're going to see what the target is on this. It's a fraction, might even be negative, but still, it's what you're trying to hit. Target equals negative one third. Interference. It's very important that we know that that interference right now is plus a positive two thirds. Oh, so I guess I went with the wrong color. If you're colorblind, then you didn't get hurt by that. And really, I'll fix the color now. Interference. Plus two thirds. Not just two thirds. It's the addition of positive two thirds. So now we want to get the inverse operation, which I'll call the inverse. The whole thing is inverting the plus two thirds. We can go plus negative two thirds. The operation, the opposite of adding a positive is adding a negative. You might think the opposite of adding a positive is subtracting that same number. It's okay. But the inverse of what we're doing here, the operation that we're reversing, right? If you say the opposite of plus is minus, then you're using minus. But if you say the opposite of adding a positive is adding a negative, that's an inverse. The whole process is an inverse. So I'm more comfortable calling it the inverse of what we got there. The operation that we're reversing is plus. So you might be saying that it's that dash that gets in there and makes it happen. But we also need the two-thirds with it. So let's do the inverse in the same, you know, in the like term columns of each one. Let's put that in there. And even though they're fractions, two-thirds plus negative two-thirds is going out to zero and not even getting written as zero. It leaves me over here with nothing but x. Now over there I've got negative two thirds. So 
All right, let's put them in the order that I see them from top to bottom in most cases, right? Negative two, come on, man. Anyway, negative one third plus negative two, th plus the negative two thirds is why I'm gonna have negative one plus negative two up there with the three. Keep the bottom, keep the denominator right. That's what we have to do. Negative one plus negative two. Together they make three, strong on the negative, it's negative one. We think x is negative one. We had some work to do because it involved fractions. If we had our calculator, we can use the ABC key. I want to set up a video that shows you how to use a calculator. What kind of calculator to get now that you can use one? They shouldn't cost you more than $10. I've seen them as low as seven. I've seen them as high as 20. Um, if you go to the bookstore, it might cost you 20, but it's very convenient to walk over to the bookstore and get one five minutes before your test. So you might pay a little bit more for it over there. But you're gonna look for a certain key on your calculator. That key is gonna say tan. It's not about the way you wanna look after summer. Okay, it's called the tangent. There's another word that'll be on there also, a letter, it'll look worse. And I'll just leave it at that. But it's not about your skin tone. It's not about you know doing things that are against someone's moral code. This is a pair of keys for tangent and sine which deal with Trigonometry. We're not doing trigonometry in this course, but I can tell you what to look for when you're looking for a scientific calculator. Look for the word tan on one of the keys, it would probably be good. That gets it scientific, but there's an even better key. And it usually doesn't cost extra. It looks something like this. Or maybe this. It looks like a mixed number with three letters in it. That's a fraction key. They throw that in for free. They really don't charge extra for that. You want to have a fraction on your calculator. Generally, people go with Casio or Texas Instruments, TI, for these. And you're looking to spend somewhere between $8 and $20 on a brand new one. And you want that key on it, because this key does fractions. If you have a calculator with one on it, I can tell you right now how to get this negative 1 third plus negative 2 thirds. Whenever you want to make a fraction, you hit that key. If you want to make a mixed number, you're going to hit that key between parts of what you're doing. It would be put in a one that's negative, hit the fraction key three, plus put in a two that's negative, hit the fraction key three. So you get negative one third plus negative two thirds. Negative one over three plus negative two over three, and you hit equals and it's gonna make negative one. I'll show you that soon on a follow-up video, but for now, we've gotta do what the fractions need us to do. Did it work? Hmm. The original equation said plus two thirds, was supposed to equal negative one-third. In here goes my number that I think is negative one. Negative one should be now made into negative one over one plus two-thirds, right? Now, we gotta get them both to be over three. So that one's looking good, I'll leave it like that. But this one's gonna be times three, so we're gonna get negative three over three plus two over three, keep the three, negative three plus two, Subtract for one, strong on the negative, and we do get that answer. Fractions are harder. There's more to them. But it still did the job. Negative one is the solution to this. It's the only number. Okay, negative two or something like that won't work. Okay, uh, positive one won't work. The only number that hits the target is having negative one going. So we have something else. The opposite of adding a positive is adding a negative. The opposite of adding a negative is to add a positive. Let's look at what we can do with multiplication. I don't need your rules. We just need to know what the inverse operation is when we're doing multiplication or division. If you want the opposite of multiplying by seven, you want to undo multiplying by seven, you're gonna still use seven, but you're gonna divide by seven. You want the opposite of dividing by negative five, you're going to multiply by negative 5. So we're going to do that same kind of process, but this is going to say 6x equals 48. Solve and check. That's what these say. 6x equals 48. We need an operator. When we get that interference, we need to know what's going on. We've got to first find our target. We're trying to get to 48 here. Interference is not just six.
your appearance involves a six. But what's going on between the six and the x? Literally between the six and the x, you might not even see it, because it's not written there as a dot that represents multiply. I'm going to write a big star to represent multiply by six. And that's the key on computers used in a lot of computer languages for multiplying anyway. But it's easier to see than a dot. It doesn't look like a decimal. You really can't put parentheses around it. Multiplying by six is what we're dealing with here. What's the inverse? The inverse operation, or the way we can get there, right, is we still have a six, but the way to do the difference between multiplying is to divide. If you take your favorite number and multiply it by three, and then divide it by three, you're back at it. Okay, if you take your favorite number and you divide it by two, hopefully it was even, then multiply it by two, you're back at it. So division and multiplication are inverse operations, but we've got to bring the operator of six along with it. So we're ready to go to this thing now where we've got six x. Now, here's how I sometimes do this. I'll write it like six is my interference. X is staying there like it is, and equals is there, and 48 is my target. Because I have the colors now, okay? I need the red to undo the blue. I need to divide by six. The opposite of six times something is to divide by six. I don't want to put a flat division sign. I sure don't want to go like this. Division is worked in fractions. So if I divide each one by six, I'm in business. What that turns into is 6 over 6 in front of my x equals 48 over 6. And we'll reduce each one. 1 over 1 in front of x is equal to divide by 6, divide by 6, 6 over 1. And that's why x equals what a flawed individual I am. Here we go. 48 divided by 6 is 8 over 1. x is 8. Now, had I continued thinking, oh, the answer is 6, I would have taken my 6 back here and done 6 times 6, which makes 36, and it's not 48. I found it to be wrong using nothing but arithmetic, or even better, in some cases, a calculator. But now, I'm going to go back and see what happens if I think my number is 8. 6 times my number is supposed to equal 48. I think my number is 8, so I put it there in parentheses. That's 6 times 8. That gets me 48. Are these two the same? Yes. I draw an arrow between the target and what I've created with my evaluated expression, then simplify. And if they're the same, I hit the target, and my number is perfect. And my answer is that x equals 8. That is my solution. 48 is the target. It looks like it's kind of sitting where the answer is when we do arithmetic, but it's not the answer. 48 is the target. The answer is the number that makes us hit the target, so we need to get an 8 in there. 6 times 8 is the perfect fit to get us to 48. So the answer or solution here is 8 trying to get us to 48. And the target as its own value is not that important. What's key is that both sides hit the same target. So there's nothing magical about, oh, I'm so glad it's 48. If it wasn't 48, nothing would ever work. This thing could have a 54 up here and have an answer of 9. And 9 would work in that one because it hits its target. So we have different targets, but we've got to get the solution to be the number that gets us there. We've got to hit the target that's in play for our exact number. Let's try dash 3x equals 27. Dash 3x equals 27. I'm going to ask you something after we find out what our target is. Target is 27. Okay. I'm asking what's going on between the 3 and the x. Okay, and I'll say that in the classroom too. I'll say, what's going on between the 3 and the x? And I'll say, just write it down in the corner of your paper. I'm not going to come around and look at it, but you want to look at it to see if your instinct was already there. Because if so, that's awesome. But this class is not just for people who have awesome mathematical instincts. What goes on between the 3 and the x? Let me make it look a little bit easier for some of us who aren't sure what goes on between the 3 and the x. Now, you're watching at home, so if you want to scream at the television, or now, in this case, at your monitor what's going on, that's fine. But I'm going to take the dash and I'm going to move it a lot further away. I'm going to change its color, right? 
I won't change this color. I'll just move it a lot further away. It's still on the same line, but here it is. Now, if you're looking at that, tell me what's going on between the 3 and the X. Now you should know. What's going on between the 3 and the X is multiplication. I'll bring the negative sign in again. And that doesn't change. Because the interference here is equal to some kind of multiplication. It's multiplication by what's called negative 3. All right, that's fine. Here's what it's not. The interference is not minus 3. The interference is not plus negative 3. The interference is a negative 3 times x, what goes on between x and its interference. And between it is this space where there's multiplication. And you can't just say it's multiplied by 3, I don't like signs, I don't worry about signs. It's negative 3. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and find the inverse. Now at this point, there are sometimes people say, wait a minute, hold on, I was good until now, and now that just happened. <clears throat> Orange. Orange means don't write it down, but watch it so you know what's not happening. This is not what's happening. Okay, that has interference of plus negative 3, and the inverse would be to add 3. That's not what we have here. See what's going on between x and the 3 is subtraction, or in this case, adding a negative. That is between them. on between x and the 3 is multiplication. And that's why this needs me to divide to get its answer. So we have less trouble when it's positive. We're like, well, nothing else going on. It must be multiplication. But that's not minus 3, right? That's negative 3. It's a dash 3 when we write it. There's nothing in front of it to cause it to be minus. But even so, going on with the x, it's multiplication. All right, so it's time to do that. We're going to divide by negative 3. We're going to divide this side by negative 3. We're going to divide this side by negative 3. Now, negative 3 over negative 3, let's get some black and red here. We've got the black dash that came on top. We've got the red dash that came from the inverse operation. We've got the 3 on top that's black. We've got the 3 on the bottom that's red. And then we got x. And over here, we got stuff going on. I'll put the negative out front. I'll black 27. I'll keep the 3 red for this one. It's not negative anymore. The negative is out in front. Opposite of negative is going to be positive, right? Two dashes will make it positive. 3 over 3 is going to get me 1. And then x. 1x is the same as x as nx. So 1x is what I'm really looking for here. And now my job is to go keep the negative in front and do 27 over 3. That's 9 over 1. x is equal to negative 9. So we had to divide by negative 3 to get this one done. And now we're going to see how that worked out. It said, let's do negative 3 times some number for x and try and get to 27. Question mark. Because we're testing it. We're checking it. A lot of people have bad ideas about checking the work. So now what we've got is two dashes, a black one from the 3 as a factor and a blue one from the 9 as a factor. We've got a black 3 times a blue 9. At this point, don't see color, and it should be 27. Opposite of negative is not something, right? It's going to be positive. It's not going to be negative. It's got two dashes, which is not odd. You may say to yourself, yeah, it's even, so it's going to be positive, which is true. But the fact is, the only way to get a negative number is with an odd number of dashes on the same term. That did it. We want to build strong structures, not just get a couple quick answers on the homework and say, I can do this, this is easy. Because when I throw something at you like 5 parentheses x minus 7 minus 3 parentheses x minus 4 equals, you're already in trouble. And never mind that the other side might be 9x minus 4 times x minus 3 close parentheses plus negative 19. All that's legal with the steps we're going to build bit by bit into our process. But right now, we're building a strong foundation of how to do single step one.
hypothesis. So don't say, I knew it was negative nine five minutes ago, I don't need this. You're building a foundation based on what you already know. What you already know allows you to be successful. What you're learning now allows you to do more with it. Negative 45 equals 15x. You target. You can stop the video if you want to look, if you want to think about it. You can keep it rolling because I'm going to put it up in a few seconds. Target is negative 45. We need interference. Interference is going to include an operation. The reason I don't see the answer is because x is not alone. That's what that's saying over there about interference. Times 15. We've got to reverse the interference with what we call the inverse. Not just the inverse operation, but the inverse of the whole process of what causes interference. I'm going to write this kind of divide sign, but I know it's going to come at me as a fraction. I'm going to put that in the denominator. So if we look at what I have here, I have negative 45 as my target. Equals is a key kind of fulcrum, if you're familiar with physics. A fulcrum is the spot in the middle where things switch around. The equal sign is really an important part, and I'll call that the fulcrum if you let me. 15 x. Now, according to this inverse, I want to go to each location where I have my number, and I want to divide it by a positive 15. I want to divide by 15. And this will take me to 1x. You can write it to 1 over 1x, then 1x, and then x, but it's x. And over on this side, I have a negative sign, and I have 45 over 15. Without my calculator, I would then have to say, oh, 15 is the smaller one, so 15 divides by 1, 3, 5, and 15. And I try 45 divided by 15. I'll actually see that makes 3. So I'm going to divide both sides by 15. I'm sorry, top and bottom by 15 here. That's when I come out of here. This is a three. I got a negative in front. I got a three on top of one. And that's why x is negative three seems to be my solution. Now over here I had negative 45, and I'm not sure that my number that I found is perfect. I'm going to got 15, and here comes the number that I found. In parentheses, here comes my negative three. I want to show you what it looked like without the parentheses. Especially if I didn't have the blue, it would look like 15 minus 3. But if you bring it in with parentheses, then you see that it's the black 15 times the negative 3, put the negative in front, 3 times 15. Okay, that's going to get you 15, and then 3 plus, you know, 1 times 3, pick up the 1, 45. If you have your calculator, which you're now allowed to use after exam 1, then you would just go ahead and put in negative 45 ABC 15. Even a calculator that does division, negative 45 divided by 15 will get you negative 3. But when we do this, if it's a fraction, it'll reduce it. It'll make it into a mixed number when necessary. It'll do a lot of the work that's so tedious for a lot of the students. They don't like doing the fraction work. And my claim has always been, if you know how to use a good fraction calculator that costs between $7 and $20, then you can do our, our algebra, even if you're not awesome at the arithmetic. And honestly, there are some people that don't like to hear that. But I can see your ability to think logically and judge that separately from your ability to manipulate numbers. And I think there's some value in that. OK, 12v equals 30. Solve and check. Stop the video for a minute, or however long you need, to come up with what you think the target is. Interference. Two things. Not just a number, and not just an operation. It's an operation and an operator. It's a thing to do and a number to do it with. 
And you don't always have to write these, but you're getting toward the goal of let me find the target and get the interference away from this on a one-step problem. So the inverse. Divide by that. Twelve times my V equals my target of thirty. And according to what I've already established, it's like it's a good time for me to divide both sides where the number is by twelve. 12 over 12 will get me 1. That's why I used the 12. I didn't say, let me just use whatever number I feel like. I'm using the 12 so I can get down to B. I got 30 over 12. If you put 30 over 12 into a fraction calculator, to 30 ABC key 12 equals, it'll bring you back something that is a mixed number. And it'll get you 2, and it would get 6 twelfths, but 2 and a half. It'll be two, then a one, then a two, two and a half. And then if you hit the second or the inverse or the key that's the funny color in the upper left corner, and you hit the ABC key again, it'll bring it back as an improper fraction, fully reduced. Our job is to get that thing. 12 is smaller. Remember, this is how I mentally go through how I'm going to find the biggest number to divide into 30. It also divides into 12. And here it is. 12 divides by 1 to get me 12, 12 divides by 2 to get me 6, 12 divides by 3 to get me 4. The next number is 4 and I already got it because here are the numbers 12 divides by 1, 2, 3, and up with 4, 6, and 12. And now I see if 30 divides by 12, which it does not. It gets me a decimal. You now have a calculator. 30 divided by 12. Decimal? No good. All right. So now we try the next one. 30 divided by 6. That's a 5. It tells me to use a 6 they both have. And it even tells me the 30 is going to go to 5. So I'll take my 30 over 12 and divide by 6, which is the GCF of the numerator and denominator. 30 divided by 6 is 5. 12 divided by 6 is up in that pair is 2. And I get 5 halves. I think my solution is 5 halves. I'll go with 12 times my number. Whoops, I usually use that all in blue, so I'll wait and do that. 12 times my number equals 30. I'm going to put in what I think my reduced value is 5 over 2. If I don't have a calculator, I'll put my 12 over 1. And what does that get for me? 12 over 1 times 5 over 2. 12 and 1 don't reduce, but 12 and 2 both are divisible by 2. Divide by 2 for 1, divide by 2 for 6. 6 times 5 over 1 times 1. 30 over 1 equals 1. Uh, sorry, 30 over 1 equals the way. 30 equals V1, the number I'm looking for. 30. It does. So as there's a fraction showing up in the problem, we do the work with the fraction when it's time to compute. We don't panic and say, there's a fraction coming up, I can't possibly do it. Because we can do it. We may not be the world's best working with fractions. We also have access to a calculator that can help us with that if we still have a weakness with that. But we can show that we've learned what's going on in the algebra and the logical thinking of proceeding to solving the problem, right? We're solving for a solution, just like you might solve a problem. Now, as we go to the next one of these, it's going to be involving a fraction. I want to figure out how I'm going to scrub out, right? I'm going to get rid of interference of some fraction. Like if I have multiplication, I want to just take you through a little bit of a reminder about what we do. We have this whole idea that 28 over 15 divided by 7 over 3. Sure, 28 divided by 7 works. So we're lucky here. 15 divided by 3 works. And we can get 4 on top and 5 on the bottom. But 28 over 15 times 3 over 7 will get me there also. How? 28 and 15 don't reduce, but 28 and 7 both divide by 7. Divide by 7 for 4, divide by 7 for 1. Let's start working on the 3. 3 and 15 both divide by 3, so we'll divide by 3, divide 15 by 3 for 5, divide 3 by 3 for 1, 4 times 1, 5 times 1, 4 over 5. This always works. That works when you're lucky enough to have good division opportunities. 
So, rather than say when we have to get rid of a multiplied fraction, let's divide by that fraction, we'll have the option to multiply by its reciprocal. And that's a great option when we're dealing with a fraction that we have to get rid of from multiplication perspective. The opposite of multiplying by a fraction could be to divide by that same fraction and then turn it into probably multiplication by its reciprocal. Why don't we go straight from the opposite of multiplying by a fraction is to multiply by its reciprocal. Instead of reversing what the operator is, the, uh, sorry, instead of reversing what the operation is from multiplication to division, let's leave that alone and let's reverse the way we use our operator, the number that does the work. We'll let the number do the heavy lifting and we'll leave it as multiplication. Because we can do multiplication and we can do canceling and reduction with multiplication that does not generally work in most cases when we have to do division. So, I want to take this one, solve 7 over 3 times x equals 28. I'm going to draw it up here in color with the x and the equals in there. But I want you to kind of see that I'm thinking green on 28. I'm thinking 7 thirds times x in blue. Somehow I'm seeing things in color right now. I'm going to ask you to find the target. Don't worry if there's a fraction. Just say the fraction when it's time to say it. So the target is 28. That's true. Great. Interference. is not just 7 over 3. It's times 7 over 3. And now, as you're looking to do the interference, you are perfectly welcome to put yourself through a struggle of work, in some cases, by switching that up, saying, I want to get the inverse of times 7 over 3. And certainly, if you're taught as an inverse operation, you're going to say, if that used to be multiply, I must switch it to divide. But we need to get the inverse outcome of this. And so we have an option to switch it to division by 7 over 3 and struggle, because there's work to come after that. Or we can leave it as multiplication and right now switch it to 3 over 7. Because when you take 7 over 3 times 3 over 7, it becomes 1, and that's what you're looking for. So instead of saying convert it to dividing by a different fraction, like dividing I don't even like, and a fraction, no, get me out, um, I'm going to say, so this multiplication, which we're a little bit tolerant of, and do the inverse of what's got to happen here with 3 over 7. So, I'm going to write my 7 over 3 right here. I'm going to leave a little space behind it. I'm going to put my x. And I'm going to put my equals. And I'm going to put my 28. So everything is there that I had. I probably need a 1 under my 28 to give it the balance of, okay, what's going on? How can 28 be a fraction? 28 over 1 is the same value as it, and it now has the pieces of the fraction, both the numerator and the denominator. And this said, the way to get rid of times 7 over 3 is to multiply by 3 over 7. And so we'll multiply each side by 3 over 7. And now you could make it 21 over 21, but better yet, because we use the reciprocal, we actually are guaranteed that when we look at this 7, we'll cancel that 7. And the 3 will cancel that 3, and we're going to get 1x all day long. Every time we do it, we're going to get 1x there. We've got to do what happens over here. But here we got 28 over 1 times 3 over 7. 28 and 1 can't reduce with a 1. 28 and 7 each divides by 7. So divide by 7, get 4. 7 divided by 7 is 1. 28 divided by 7 got to be 4. This tells me that x equals 4 times 3 over 1 times 1, which is 12 over 1, which is 12. I think x is 12. So when you have a fraction times your variable, you can multiply by its reciprocal. You could have said, I'm going to divide by 7 over 3, and I'm going to divide this by 7 over 3, and by the time you did your work of to take the 28 over 1 and divide by 7 over 3, switch it to multiply by 3 over 7, you would be doing the same work with extra steps. So we've now got the inverse of the outcome, thanks to the red inverse of multiplying by 3 over 7. It looks like 12 wants to work, so we'll see. 7 over 3 is supposed to equal 28. My number wants to be 12. 
Now you can take your, graph, take your calculator and do 7abc3 times 12 equals, and we'll get you the 28 if that's what we're meant to be. Now, if I put a 1 under by 12, I can see how this still works with the arithmetic we've worked on in earlier course, the earlier parts of the course. 7 and 3 don't reduce 7 and 1, 1 doesn't reduce to anything, but take the 12. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 7 times 4 over 1 times 1. 28 over 1. 28 hits the target. The perfect answer, the solution to this problem is 12. Finally, I wanted to just give you this summary of what's going on, what we've been doing. So it puts together the concept of why we try to do it, kind of summing up what we've done here. Inverses make an operation get scrubbed away or neutralized. What the blue does, the red undoes. The additive inverse is called the opposite, and that's because the sign of what you're adding is reversed. The multiplicative inverse, the number you use for multiplying, to undo multiplying, is called the reciprocal and causes sometimes a fractional form of the number to be inverted so it can do its job of neutralizing. So as you're working on homework seven, you're working on these one-step equations. They take you through one step to lead you to x, and then the other side contains the computation to the solution. You find the solution you tried in the original, hit the target, perfect. Don't try and master everything in one day. Try and master for 100% what we've got going on in seven, because when we get to eight, we're gonna challenge further the concepts of how to find the perfect solution for each one of these equations. Good luck.